take time. Thrillerbark is better than Marineford. Most arcs are better than Marineford. Marineford's just okay. Look, I know everyone just instinctively hit dislike, but hear me out. Luffy pushes a zombie back into the ground in Thrillerbark. Best One Piece arc ever. Seriously, though, I legitimately think Thrillerbark is one of the best arcs of One Piece, and I don't think it gets the love it deserves. Obviously, everyone's allowed to have their own opinions, and if you don't like Thrillerbark, that's totally acceptable. I can't judge harshly. I think Marineford's just okay. I'm the king of bad One Piece opinions. Here's another. Buggy's more annoying than funny. I will burn for these sins. But still, I'm hopeful that people can at least walk away from this video with a higher appreciation of Thrillerbark. Let's talk about the four most interesting things about the Thrillerbark arc. Yo ho ho ho, yo ho ho ho. In practice, Halloween is the worst holiday. It's the only one that requires manual labor to get the goodies. I'll take Thanksgiving or Christmas over it any day. But aesthetically, Halloween is the best holiday. I love horror-themed aesthetics, so it's no surprise that I was immediately drawn into Thrillerbark. This is a bit of an obvious point because you all have eyes, so does it really belong into the categorization of interesting? Yes, because Oda isn't content to just utilize the aesthetic, but he incorporates it in several interesting ways. The most impressive is definitely how well it mixes typical monster mythology within One Piece's own mythos. I'm an expert in monster mythology, I've watched all 15 seasons of Supernatural, and it's really cool to see how Oda mixes the two. The most prominent example being the ability to use salt to purify the zombies, which is something that matches both the religious folklore while also incorporating the devil fruit's natural weakness, since salt embodies the power of the ocean. It manages to remain internally consistent with the world of One Piece, while also providing unique flavor to the arc with real world homages. While not as intrinsically tied to the established lore of One Piece, the way saddles were handled were clever and consistent. Like the Dio ending, where it looked like the saddleless crew were going to be disintegrated, only to be resurrected because the saddles and bodies must match, it was handled incredibly well with how we saw that implement in the battle against Oars. And while we made it internally consistent, it was still based in mythology, like how many depictions of vampires can't survive in the sunlight. And of course, Brook's entire existence, as well as the existence of most of the bad guys featured here, operate under the same rules. Bring it to life all these spooky creatures in a way that perfectly messes within the rules of One Piece. Because of this, Thrillerbark might contain the strongest sense of mystery to it. The whole island is a mystery and all the answers are satisfying and clever, like Thrillerbark not even being an island. It even concludes with a lingering mystery, with whatever those monsters in the Florian Triangle were. I love this ending so much, I honestly find it to be one of the most chilling scenes in One Piece. The allure of the mystery figures will never leave me. Beyond that, this monster mask becomes a great tool for some very effective comedy utilizing horror tropes. Again, refer to the aforementioned Luffy zombie scene. Yo ho ho ho, yo ho ho ho. Along with a new location, most arcs of One Piece introduce new villains for our heroes to deal with. While I find Moria to be one of the weaker big bads for a major arc, his crew might actually be the strongest. Oda accomplishes this by employing a technique that he never really attempts again. He gives each of the remaining Mysterious Four their own satellite character they see a quirky dynamic with. Despite being on the same team, these dynamics are all antagonistic. Kinda like a crew full of Zoros and Sanjis, but obviously the ways in which their relationships conflicts are different. Hogback and Sindri's relationship has it one way, from Sindri to Hogback, with her distaste of plates and savage moments towards Hogback being a constant source of amusement. With Perona and Kumasi, it's the opposite, with Perona being unjustly harsh to Kumasi, forbidding him from speaking because it's not cute, leading to some of the funniest moments when the coward trio hid inside him and he wasn't allowed to inform her. Finally, Absalom has Lola, less of a satellite character than the other two because Absalom wants nothing to do with her, with whereas Lola wants to marry him. It's not nearly as funny as the other two, but it makes for an interesting dynamic. This also made the scene where all of them, sans Lola, came together for Oz an incredibly fun time with all these established dynamics playing off each other and intersecting. Regardless, having all these villains have these comedic infights does a great job of endearing them to the audience, because if their screen time is often spent with you laughing, you're just going to get more attached to them. Humor is considered by many to be one of, if not the most important thing 
in a relationship for a reason. Oda usually does this by giving characters their own specific gags, but something about the gags being rooted in character interplay just makes it a lot more effective to me. Not only that, but each of these relationships features a stark change that makes them all the more memorable. The least notable here is certainly Perona and Kumasi. Seeing Perona's volatile reaction at Kumasi being purified despite previously only really reprimanding him is pretty basic, but still effective. Absalom and Lola's is interesting because it's more of a reflection of Lola's relationship with Nami than anything to do with them. But knowing full well Lola's obsession with Absalom makes her rescue attempt all the more heartwarming. And she does end up having her way with a knocked out Absalom, a fitting resolution to a villain as rapey as Absalom was. But the most effective and powerful one was the swap in dynamic between Hogback and Sindri's relationship. Sindri as a whole could qualify as her own sexon. I love her backstory and relationship dynamic. Was there anything more disturbing in this horror-filled arc than the complete obedience Sindri had to Hogback's demeaning requests? Was there anything more serenely impactful than Sindri's smile as she refused Hogback's final request? The whole zombie resurrection aspect of this arc feels complete with our send-off. Zombies are often treated just as monsters. Once you're zombified, the human element of it is often ignored in these types of stories, as the focus is instead placed on survival. But Sindri here serves as a reminder of the human soul left behind. Ryuma has this a little bit, and Sato's maintaining personality quirks at first in new bodies also touches into this aspect, but it's Sindri who gets the spotlight one last time. <laughs> However, the star of most arcs aren't the villains, but the Straw Hat Pirates themselves, and Thriller Bark features some of the most interesting use of the Straw Hat Pirates in all of One Piece. A lot of this has to do with them bucking previously established trends, like how Book immediately accepts Luffy's proposal to join the crew. Admittedly, he does backpedal on that, but considering the vast majority of crew members initially refused to join, Book's quick yes is not only a funny moment, but it sets the stage for Thriller Bark's continual unique usage of the crew. This is made apparent by the decision to separate and focus on the coward trio, a choice I personally love. For starters, the situations are naturally more tense considering Nami, Usopp, and Chopper's disposition, as well as their relative lack of powers in comparison to their comrades. It was more engaging to watch because you never knew if they'd be able to save themselves or if they were being set up to be rescued. It also allowed for some nice character exploration. Nothing too deep, but whether it be Chopper's admiration for Hogback, Usopp's superstitions, or Nami's calculations and greed, it's a good time watching these three. Oda also does a great job basically using the Coward Trio's track to Hogback's mansion as a bunch of setups for punchlines when the rest of the crew follow after them. The disparity in reactions between the two sets of crewmates is quite often hilarious. See the Coward Trio flipping out while Luffy just casually pushes the zombie back into the grave? Okay, that's the last time I'll bring that up, I promise. Luffy asking the tree to join his crew is another funny example, or how they managed to tame Cerberus. The Monster Trio are another brilliant version of expectation, though. Like I said, the Coward Trio segment worked in part because it was possible that they were just being set up to be rescued, but in a brilliant twist, the ones who require saving are the three most powerful members of the crew, as Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji are the ones who get their saddles stolen. It was slightly disappointing at first that they did eventually wake up to contribute to the arc, rather than just relying on the remaining crew members to save them first, but the reversal of expectations is still cool, and what Oda does following waking them up is probably even better. Because what makes Thriller Bark truly special in the context of how it utilizes the crew is that Thriller Bark, more than any other arc, is a team effort. Most of the encounters in this arc rely on multiple members of the crew, the only real exceptions to this being Zoro vs Ryuma and Usopp vs Perona, but both of these matches make a point to emphasize teamwork. For the former, we see Brook's failed attempts at fighting with Yuma segueing into Zoro's battle with him, so the battle has a stronger team connection due to that, although there's no doubt that Zoro beat Yuma with his own strength. As for the latter, Usopp is stressed as the only member capable of defeating Perona because of his naturally negative personality, which is hilarious but also emphasizes the importance of their team. And his lobby had elements of this type too, mostly when it concerns Sanji. Whether it be his inability to fight Khalifa or his encouraging Usopp as the only one who can save Robin, Thrillabark not only has this type with the two previously mentioned fights, but literally every other bad guy is defeated through team effort. Chopper and Robin team up to defeat Hogback, even though technically Sindri and 
Oulis finished the job. Absalom is defeated through a team effort of Sanzi, Lola, and Nami, even though Nami delivers the phantom blow. Oda makes a point to note that it worked because of how tired out Absalom was from fighting Sanji, granting value to Sanji's efforts while allowing Nami to get her revenge directly. And of course, the epic fight against Oars and Moria. I love this fight so much, and the conclusion of the fight where literally every single Straw Hat member serves a crucial role in defeating Oars is one of the most satisfying finishes to any fight in all of One Piece, and One Piece excels in amazing fight finishes. To be fair, Luffy does get his captain moment defeating Sato's Asgard on his own, but standards in between two incredible crew efforts, it hardly detracts from Thilobok being an arc that exemplifies the teamwork of the Straw Hats better than any other arc. As for the final encounter with Kuma, while they don't technically win, it's undeniably the most prominent example of the loyalty instilled in the Straw Hat Pirates. Both Zoro and Sanji's willingness to sacrifice themselves for the crew is incredibly heart wrenching in this circumstance, especially considering Zoro and Sanji's typically vitriolic relationship, which again, is sort of a recurrent theme of Thrillabark, with all the villain dynamics featuring a stark change in their dynamic. This also leads to what might be the most epic moment in all of One Piece when nothing happened. After the whole CP9 affair tested the bonds of the Straw Hat Pirates in very real ways. Following that up with an arc all about showcasing the bonds of the Straw Hat Pirates was a genius decision. It doesn't have as much character depth as something like Water 7, but Through the Bark makes wise usage of established dynamics and it displays just how much of a well oiled unit the Straw Hat Pirates truly are. Yo ho ho ho, yo ho ho ho. But by far, the most interesting thing about Thrillabark is its position in the series as Thrillabark serves as a massive turning point in One Piece's narrative structure. It manages to serve as a last hurrah of sorts while also being the start of a new direction that has carried the series forward to this day. It functions as a representation of both One Piece's past and its future, and the most impressive aspect here is that this fits thematically within Thrillabark's own story, as Thrillabark is all about the past connecting to the present and leading on to the future. Before I discuss how Thrillabark operates as a transition for the series, I think it's better if I elaborate on Thrillabark's themes with the past and future. Without a doubt, the central figure in this is Brook, the newest Straw Hat pirate, a former pirate who's been dead for decades only currently more motivated by his desire to be reunited with an old friend, a whale named Laboon. Without question, the reveal that Brook's backstory ties directly into Laboon, a character we met hundreds of chapters ago who seemingly just existed as a checkmark for the finish line of the series, is one of the greatest moments in the entire narrative. The way it's handled is fantastic too, with Brook initially only telling Frankie and Robin, two members who never met Laboon, and only seeing Frankie's reaction. We don't get to find out until Frankie tells everyone else, everyone with the connection, and also Chopper? Of course, knowing Laboon is still waiting definitively reinvigorates Brook. Another notable example has to do with Brook's shadow, or the body it gets attached to, Ryuma. Ryuma is actually from one of Oda's earlier works, a one shot called Monsters that is a really solid read. Stuff like that is just incredibly cool, but in line with what I stated previously, it's not just a cool nod to his previous work. As Zoro leaves with Susui, a blade that serves Zoro well and carry plot relevance in the Wano arc. These are the two most prominent examples, but the concept of the zombies carries this as well. To an extent, Sindri's story carries this theme too, as well as he didn't have much of a future, the humanity lingering behind did cause Hogback's defeat. There's also Nami's relationship with zombie Lola that influences her relationship with non-zombie Lola, along with the more standard being trapped in Thrillabark 2 to their past and regaining their saddles allowing them to move forward to the future and out of the midst of the Florian Triangle. Now, back to my original assertion. How Thrillabark represents both the past and the future of One Piece, functioning as a present representation of what we're used to and what's to come. Prior to Thrillabark, One Piece was very easily segmented through its sagas. The East Blue, Broke, Rock, Sky Pier, and CP9 sagas very easily stood on their own. There was definitely connections between them, but One Piece undoubtedly had a strong episodic feel to it. Sky P was just the next amazing events that they encountered after Alabasta, there wasn't any strong connective tissue between the two storylines. After Thriller Bark though, that all changes. Sabri starts this lengthy solo story arc for Luffy, where he tries to save his brother Ace from execution that leads directly into a time skip. From Sabri forward, One Piece gains strong narrative propulsion. Every arc and saga leads more naturally into each other. This is a great way to showcase the growth of One Piece, how the plot between each arc and saga gains stronger ties to each other. 
each other. Luffy's feud with Big Mom started all the way back in Fistman Island, and has been a continuous threat since then right up until the current day in the Wano arc, whereas the other Yonko Luffy has his sights set on Kaido has also been built up for a very long time. Wano is an arc that has been built up with ostensibly every single post time skip arc, and in truth, it all begins with Thrillabark. I'm not arguing that Thrillabark is a transitionary arc solely on the notion that Wano was first mentioned here, though that is certainly worth noting. No, I'm arguing that because Thrillabark embodies both of these types of arcs. It starts off as the most secluded arc in all of One Piece, at least Sky P was closely tied to Jaya, and had it simply resolved with the defeat of Moya, it would have been. The arc does primarily capture the standalone nature that permeated throughout the first half of the series, but instead, right before the climactic battle with Moya gets underway, he's visited by a fellow Shichibukai, Bartholomew Kuma, to report about Blackbeard and offer assistance as the world government worries about the Straw Hats beating him. The world government will write to worry, and it's Kuma's involvement after the fact that truly establishes a shift in how One Piece operates. Though the Bark is no longer this self-contained adventure, Kuma's battle with the Straw Hats finally bridges the Straw Hats with the ongoing background plot of Blackbeard and Ace. After the Kuma matter is settled, Luffy even learns that Ace's life is in danger thanks to the Vivi card, connecting us back to Alabasta. Come forth the next arc, Kuma reappears and single-handedly saves and ends the Straw Hat Pirates, allowing for the story to sift gears into Luffy's journey to save his brother. I think many would point to Sabity as the point in the series where One Piece sifts gears to more tightly connected arcs, but it's building off what Thrillabark established near the end. Thrillabark is honestly the point where One Piece arcs start to be more tightly connected even though the majority majority of it does exist in a standalone capacity. It's the final hurrah for that type of story arc in One Piece while also ushering in the new era for the series. And those were the four most interesting things about the Thrillabark arc in One Piece. Hopefully this explained why I consider Thrillabark to be one of the strongest arcs in all of One Piece for those who don't care for it, and validated those who do love it as much as I do. Also you probably noticed that I would constantly refer to the comedy of Thrillabark throughout this essay. It doesn't constitute as one of the most interesting things, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Thrillabark is easily the funniest arc in One Piece. Darkin and Robin's reaction to it is perhaps the greatest joke in all of One Piece. Robin as a whole was on fire this arc. Her macabre attitude and kitty thoughts were hilarious. And I know I promised, but Luffy summoned that zombie back into his grave!